It's a high-tech conversation. On the low-tech topic. Live on the World Wide Web via Zoom. Bench Talk 101. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Bench Talk 101. This week, we're going to talk about our favorite finishes. So uh, if everyone, if anyone doesn't know how this usually works, uh, pop your name in the chat and, um, and then you'll be asked to unmute and uh, talk about your favorite finish. Who'd like to go first? Matthias. Yeah, might as well. Uh, before I, I start talking about my favorite finishes, I should add the ca uh, caveat that I am not an expert finisher. I'm not an expert anything really, but uh, I've not been, been woodworking seriously that long. But I have a couple of products that I have started using. And also, I'm not going to say anything particularly uh, shocking or, or new or, or uh, that will surprise anyone. Uh, but a couple, I have some finishes that I haven't used it. I have a couple of bottles of peacock oil that I'm saving for, or not saving, but I haven't yet had any project running where uh, they seemed appropriate. But uh, one finish that I've used with uh, very good results is this one. It's a French varnish called Le Tonquinois. So it's a spa varnish. Uh, I'm not sure if it is technically a varnish in the sense that I haven't been able to find out whether or not it actually contains any either natural or synthetic resins. Uh, so it's more, it's a stand oil varnish. So uh, the main ingredient is uh, polymerized linseed oil. So linseed stand oil uh, with a fair bit of tongue oil added as, added as well. Uh, no VOCs, at least they claim no VOCs, although from the olfactory experience, I'm not entirely sure that I believe them. It, it's not hor horribly smelly, but it does smell a bit. Uh, because it's a spa varnish, it's uh, good for any, anywhere where you need uh, to be able to, to handle, so, so any wet circumstances, it's, it's, a, it's a boat varnish. And it's also, uh, it means that it's flexible. So it's a fairly uh, long oil, uh, based varnish, so so uh, nice, flexible, and it's quite easy to apply. It's just you just brush it on. Uh, it takes about twenty four hours between coats, so it's a bit slow to work with. But on the other hand, that also means that uh, the self leveling properties are quite good. So that's one I really like. Uh, I'm also uh, this one I received today. It's just boiled linseed oil made by Ottoson in Sweden, in a village called Jenap, where my maternal grandfather's ancestors used to farm in the 18th century. I don't know if they farmed the uh, uh, flax, probably, but anyway, it's a very nice, this is just pure boiled linseed oil don't even think it's got much in the way of dryers in it. And the smell is just absolutely delightful. This is one, uh, as I said, I got this one today, so I can't really claim it as a favorite, but it's what I'm planning to uh, put on my workbench when that's finished. And then I have shellac. It's, I've used shellac a bit and that I really, really, really like. Uh, I haven't done proper French polishing. I've just used it as, uh, as a varnish, as a, as a surface, uh, as a fil film creating uh, varnish, and it's just gorgeous to work with because it's so easy. Uh, basically, once you've wiped on one coat, it's already dry where you started, so you can start all over again, uh, straight over, or, or maybe wait a couple of minutes uh, between coats, so you can really 
it takes a number of coats to build up, but you, because the coats dry so fast, you can work quite a, a efficiently. And also, of course, because each new coat slightly dissolves the underlying coat, they all form a single coat together, which is, is one of the really nice things about, about uh, shellac. That and the fact that uh, it's just alcohol, ethanol as, as uh, a solvent, which is, ethan ethanol can certainly be deadly, but not just from, from, from uh, smelling it in the room where you're working. It's not, if it's gonna give you cancer, you will have to drink it first. Uh, so that was pretty much what I was planning to show. So thank you very much. Now we're over to Jim. Ah, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was going to talk about shellac, but I see that Chester's waving around there. But I will point out that it is my least favourite finish as of this week. So that's, that's if not familiar with... Uh, I know uh, Matthias waved around a tin of flakes, but I quite like the buttons. So I've got these from Muscat in the Middle East. I don't know why. Um, but the reason I, I, I mean, that's the preview, obviously. You do get quite a nice finish, as Matthias was saying. And, um, but I'm never, ever going to do this again. Um, so I'd just like to share. A, by the way, this is sponsored by Alfie Shine, which is probably the best finish you can buy. It is available. Um, just look into the chat and I will leave information. I only the host can share, only the host can share this meeting, it says. I have a thing I need to share. Photograph, sir. With my favorite. Thank you very much, sir. Screen. Where is it now? Has it all gone funny on me? So um, this is my favorite finish, which is Matthias was talking about uh, polymerized oils. Um, I, I love polymerized oils and, and uh, true oil is a pol polymerized linseed and, and other proprietary oils. But as you can see, this photograph, which is actually upside down, is the sort of finish that you can you can achieve on it and uh, it has so many different uh, ways of application which is why I like it. It is uh, easier I think having experienced this week uh, polishing with shellac um, that it is easier than um, shellac I believe and it can be used um, matte where you can rub it in a gun stock or etc on your fingers um, or you can you can get uh, multiple homogenous homogeneous layers because it does equally burn into itself uh, and you end up with uh, a, a gloss finish which is where I um, oh I don't know why it's done that why is it stop doing things like that oh buttons which is why I used it on a similar exactly the same burr it isn't far different in terms of finishing but uh, you can get that deep uh, pond finish um, that you want to achieve with um, true oil. So I, I think of all the finishes that uh, I would choose to, if I had only one to choose from, uh, I started out um, working on uh, guitars with it. And this is a, a Les Paul copy that um, needed a, a deep gloss finish. And most people consider true oil to be, um, you know, uh, a matty finish but but it's not so that that would be 100 percent the finish that i would choose apart from um the obvious one which i was told not to mention apparently um but brought to you by uh, a dog near you so that's that so i don't know how i turn this off how do i turn it off can somebody turn me on there you go thank you cheers jim um, I think we're we're looking at a potential live demonstration live demonstration from Chester. It's Chester's turn next. Did that work? Yes, it did. So uh, I, I I didn't intend to do a live demonstration per se. Uh, this is a walnut chair that I just uh, finished for a client, and uh, I'm I'm applying right now raw linseed oil, and um, 
because some of it is green wood and some of it is dry when I put it together, the two acclimate and tighten. There's no glue in the chair at all. Um, so, uh, so I'm using raw linseed oil and letting it soak it in and soak it in and soak it in. And then the uh, final coat will be a polymerized uh, linseed because uh, I don't like using boiled linseed oil. It's, uh, it's just too toxic, uh, the dryers in it. But, um, but although I'm interested in what Matthias was saying that he has one there that's a, a boiled linseed oil that doesn't smell bad. So I'm a little surprised about that. Also, I like putting the uh, linseed oil on because it's a woven seat. And, uh, and so this is seagrass and the, it seems to like to take the oil as well and soak it in. And, and stays fairly moist. I won't put the polymerized on there. I'll just use the raw linseed oil on that part of it. Um, but what I thought I was gonna would share um, is um, since we did this uh, thing before on books and things, I thought I'd share some of the books that I use to work out my finishes and my what I've had for years. I've had all of these over 20 years, and some of them are some of them are. Um, probably 50 or 60 or 70 years old. Um, but I think they're great. And, uh, and you can find these in used bookstores. They, and they go fairly cheap, uh, this sort of thing, because people aren't rushing out after this stuff as much as the woodworking books. But staining and polishing, everything for wood finishing. Um, this is by Bellin, which uh, Bellin makes a salad bowl finish today, but this is from the 1950s. Um, but they were actually publishing books on it. This is, uh, this is refinishing old furniture. This is during the last, the big the war in the forties. Wood finishing by Vander Walker is really good. Um, practical painting and wood finishing. This is from the sixties, early sixties. And um, this is a, a US Department of Commerce, which is kind of funny, a paint manual with particular reference to federal specifications. So these were for, I guess, people that were bidding on government jobs. And, and what they were required. One of the best books and one of the best finishers, the, one of the most famous ones is George Frank. And um, he's been published, I don't know how many books he has on wood finishing and, uh, and, and he's been published in fine woodworking and other magazines for years. Um, he's the sort of the master at wood finishing. Um, this is another Bellin Brothers book from the 1940s. I don't know if you can see that one. And this one that I love, but I use it more humorously. This is uh, the first American, uh, the first American furniture finishing manual, which is a reprint from the Cabinet Maker's Guide of 1827. And I thought I'd, I'd uh, just play a little game with you here because I know a lot of you uh, are so particularly like Jim, and, and you're so knowledgeable about these uh, these uh, chemical. Uh, combinations and concoctions. I was wondering how many people knew some of these in the glossary of terms. Um, one is called air wood, um, which is just normally air dried wood. Alkanet root, a traditional organic dye material yielding a strong though fairly fugitive red. Um, aloes, alum, amber. And there's about 10 pages of these uh, elder coal, flake white, French berries, Avignon berries. The, the fruit of the French plant, um, smaller in size than peas and yielding yellow dye. This is a, a fascinating little study. Um, so what I'm gonna share with you right now is, uh, this is uh, my paint kit that I, I keep. And all of these are a company that I, I love. Um, it's Dr. P.H. Uh, Martin and their concentrated colors. Um, now they're watercolors, but, um, but you can always apply an oil finish over water. You just can't do the opposite. So what I do is I use these to blend. There's blues, greens, different yellows. And I use those when I'm doing a piece of vintage furniture that I need to match a coloring on either a piece of um, veneer or something like that. I'll do this first to get the color right. And this is, this is all for small use, small pieces. And then, I'll, and then I'll go over that with my finish. But that I use these to, to match. And you can thin them or you can mix them easily. And then this is my magic marker box. And in here, I have probably 50 different magic markers of different uh, tints and, uh, and they're Prismacolors and they're great art markers to so one side is fine and the other side is a broad marker. Um, so that's the, uh, this is the, the little point. 
And then uh, on the, in the other side uh, is the broad mar marker point. And the nice thing about these is when you're doing a little patch and you need to get the grain line to go across right, I'll use these to draw in the grain. And uh, there's like five different browns. Um, so you can really do rosewood or maple, different things to blend those together. And then some of the other finishes that I use are um, on maple, I like using uh, vinegar with steel because it kind of gives it a silver ash color. And I just have a piece of Brillo and some vinegar there. Mineral oil, teak oil, different colorants. And um, like I said, now this is a new chair. This, this has never gotten a finish, this walnut. So it's soaking in this linseed oil and I want it to soak in as much as possible because it's gonna be a porch chair. Um, so I'm trying to get it to soak in as much and then I'll let it dry for about a week and then I'll put a polymerized finish on it and then I'll go over it with a wax. The problem is that the only Alfie shine, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on this station, but the only Alfie shine that you can get are in these small tins, which are great for like keeping your coffee hot. But other than that, when you're doing a job this big, I need a pint or, you know, a quart. So um, maybe the company that owns Alfie Shine has sent me that as a promo. I doubt it. But at any rate, that's it. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoyed this time with me. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Thanks, Jester. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll go over to Mitch now. Well, I, uh, I prefer tongue oil when I can, things for myself and things where I know I can maintain them if they need maintenance. Um, but if there's anything that uh, I can't control where it's gonna be used and what's gonna happen to it, or I won't be able to maintain it over time, then I like um, acrylic lacquer. And I particularly like chestnut products, acrylic lacquer. I've used that for a number of years now. And they also do an acrylic uh, sanding sealer, which works really well too. It, it couldn't be simpler to use this product. And uh, that's why I use it and it really protects surfaces uh, incredibly well. You can get anything from a, a matte through to a, a gloss finish with it if you want. Um, I tend to go semi um, a matte or a semi matte and uh, that just looks super on wood. Uh, that's about it really. All right, thank you Mitch. Um, over to Eric. No, find my mute button. Yeah, I, I do uh, all sorts of different finishes. I don't think I've got a, a favourite finish really. Uh, and recently, I've been burning things. That, that's it. That's all. That's it. this. This end is burnt. You can't see it that well, but it's, it's black. Uh, and the other end is uh, the the steel steel wool uh, and vinegar that uh, that Chester was talking about. So it's sort of ebonized, and that's quite nice. And then I would just oil that and wax it. But my, my tip for oiling, I, I don't, don't really like using the, the volatile uh, VOCs, you know, they tend to sort of go for your nose a bit. Uh, so I would go for raw, raw linseed oil and you get a bit of raw, raw linseed oil, that's fine. It's not that uh, cheap. And I, I made an interesting discovery. I was talking to uh, one, of, one of the neighbours and they've got a horse. And apparently you give horses linseed oil, raw linseed oil for various horse complaints. So you can get this much linseed oil for about the same price as that. And it's exactly the same thing. So go to the equestrian stores, not the, not the DIY or woodworking stores. But once, I, once I've oiled it, I'll then put on things like, you know, like anti antique wax or just beeswax and carnauba furniture polish. But uh, if you want a really nice smell, the favourite has to be this one. You know, the shine. You can't go wrong with that. It's really, really good. I'm a big, a big fan. So that, that would be my, my top coat finish for, for indoors. So that, that's it. I am open to suggestions and hoping to learn lots tonight to get some new ideas. I'd like to get into shellac. I've never, I've never tried that. So I think that's my, my next uh, step down the path. Yeah, and finish up with Alfie Shine, of course, you know. <laughs> right. All right, thank you, Eric. Um, I think we're over to Rusty. Hey, guys. Um, I use a couple of things. So on chairs, it's usually a mix of 
linseed oil, uh, spar varnish, and um, solvent. So that, that's usually mineral spirits in, in different uh, proportions and then wax. Um, but what I use on tabletops is shellac and, and shellac usually is considered to be not very durable. And so people usually don't use it on tabletops or surfaces that will take um, a lot of use. So there's this product. So if you look in the chat, uh, Trinic, maybe in a minute, you can click on that uh, link for just a few seconds um, and show people. So there's this product called Royal Lac. And as far as I know, it's one guy in California who makes this in his garage. So it's basically shellac based and it has resins in it. And after a cure of about a month, it becomes impervious to alcohol, boiled water, regular water. So Shernik, if you can click on this from the, the mark that I put there, you, you'll see what he's doing in this um, uh, proving video, he calls it. Can you share that? Yeah, just push play. Next, I pour the boiling water into the cup. So this is after he put shellac and it cured, and you can see that there's a cup he's filling with boiling water. Next, I have the vodka. So he's pouring vodka right on shellac, yeah? And plain water. Okay, Shani, can you pause it right here, please? Okay, so if, if you work with true shellac, then you have an idea of what's gonna happen. Um, it's going to completely, all, all three of those will be completely ruined. Uh, well, in this video, he comes back an hour later and wipes it off and there's no, no damage at all. Uh, Shrenik, would you stop sharing, please? So the good thing about this product is that you can apply it just as you would apply shellac. So I usually use trench polish. Um, but at the same time, it, it becomes uh, durable enough. So my desk that I work on has this finish and my dining table has this finish. Scratches, there's, there's no way to go about. You, you know, regardless of the surface, unless it's maybe epoxy, you, you're not gonna scratch easily. But scratches will still be there, but because it's, it's shellac based, it's easy to repair. And for those liquids, it's pretty resistant. I have not tested it with wine, but I have put wine glasses on both of those surfaces and I don't have any signs. Um, so I just thought I'll mention that not a lot of people know about it. I find out from Doucette and Wolf, um, the furniture makers up in Vermont, I think. They have a beautiful YouTube uh, channel. And I contacted them and Matthew uh, said that that's what he uses. And I don't hear from other people, anybody knowing about them, but I think it's a great product. A friend of mine used it on his countertops in the kitchen. And after a year, there was no signs of uh, any deterioration. That's all I have. How about coloring? Does it uh, does it yellow or does it stay pretty clear? I I really cannot answer that because I'm colorblind. So to me, it stays clear. But uh, I'm sure that somebody was more discerning eye that they'll notice something. Uh, do you have any pictures of it that you could share, maybe? I can run into the shop and bring a can. Um, no, no, I, I, then I, I mean, is that I mean the finished surfaces, uh, if you had anything handy. Um, hold on one second. I'll, I'll take you to my dining table. Bear with me. Are you bearing? I don't know, but that guy that was pouring the liquids had a very similar accent to yours. And he was oh, drinking come on. on. <laughs> that, that is such a compliment. <laughs> this is my dining table has uh, been there for, I don't know, two years. And we use it every day. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I can blame my 13 year old for all the scratches, but I'm sure, sure it was all me. She How just... difficult is it to apply? Yeah. That's, that? That... Go How difficult is it to apply? Do you have to do a French polish with it or do you just well, brush shellac, it? Well, shellac, right? The same way that you would apply shellac. If you're comfortable brushing shellac, by all means, I use an applicator. 
So I use it as French polish. How, how does that work? Because when, you, when you're doing shellac, the, one of the key issues with shellac is it burns into itself, so it becomes homogenous. And, and, and so each layer is uh, going to use the alcohol within the solvent of the, the it's lac. It's exactly the same. But how does that work? And then it doesn't when it's dry, because it's dry when you apply the next coat. And yet, if you pour vodka on it, it doesn't dissolve it. So how does so it, it takes dissolve? A, it takes a month to cure. Right? Oh, I see. So that, OK, yeah. That's okay. what it is, right? So when you apply it during the application, it's exactly shellac. OK. Thanks for telling me now instead of last week. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, you, if you're asking me for to write you a formula, you're talking to the wrong guy. No, no, no. It doesn't matter. But you can't buy it in the UK anyway. I've looked. Is that so? I I've looked everywhere. I can't find it anywhere. I've been dying to use it since I saw the uh, the uh, article, many many articles on it for years now. The guy's absolutely world renowned for a fantastic finish. It's the ultimate. Refresh finish. what it's called. Refresh us with the name of it. French Royal Lab. Lab. Royal Lab. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll be I'll be possibly flying to UK in November. Um, I don't know if they'll let me on the plane with a. Canada. Yeah, I doubt it. I doubt it. That, that's the problem. It's got to come by sea. It's got to come by sea, and I, I, I'll have a word with Matthew. See if he wants to import something a bit special, because I reckon it's going to take off big style in the UK if it ever got here. I'll if be you doing do take it over there. Put a little wick out of the top of the jar, just so. <laughs> yeah, they need to change the name and call it after a dog. But apart from that, you know, it's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. I Rusty. think that that's his dog's name is Royal. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Rusty, you didn't mention how you finish your spoke shapes. I use that. All I've right. used true oil once. I really didn't like the feel of it. All the spoke shapes get Royal Lab. Amazing. All right. I think we're even. You have a thirty-day delay in delivering those, Rusty, for it to cure, or do you deliver it? Before I, I just cured. assume that nobody is going to stick them in a bottle of vodka for 30 days. That's probably a good assumption. <laughs> oh, I apologize. Uh, Richard Arnold. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I am. I was trying to think of something I could come up. I'm, I'm no great expert at finishing, um, but I was trying to think of something that m maybe some people have never heard of. Um, when I worked in the musical instrument trade, anybody that's, um, well, not just touching in old instruments, but I've used it on when I'm trying to restore furniture. And it's, it's a varnish um, that was, um, brought about by a guy called Simon F. Ciccone. I don't know whether anybody's ever heard of him, but he was the top restorer for Wurlitzer in um, America for years and years and worked on all the strats and wrote um, a very famous book at the time, which was The Secrets of Stradivari. But he was a world-renowned, top, top-renowned restorer of musical instruments. But he came up with a, a varnish uh, specifically for doing restoration and it was called the 1704 varnish um, and it's basically uh, a shellac type finish but the recipe is 45 grams of seed lac 7.5 grams of gum elami 200 mils of alcohol and 9 mil of uh, oil of spike lavender and we used to make that up ourselves in the workshop. And it is a brilliant, very, very fine, pale um, varnish that's really, really good for touching in repairs on old instruments or furniture or anything like that. And with that, we used to mix pigments in, a bit like Chester was saying, but we used to use dry powder uh, watercolour pigments. And we only ever used three colours. We worked out that you only needed three colours. The oil we used was black, yellow, and red, and you could find anything with those three colours. Uh, and we that we used to use Windsor and Newton powder colours, but unfortunately they don't make them anymore. And I haven't found an equivalent yet, but I'm still playing around with that. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention was if anybody could ever ever 
come up with some of this for me. <laughs> this is my few remaining little bits of this. This was given to me by the guy I used to work for. Um, this has probably been knocking around for years and years. It's, it's a finishing paste and we used to finish the ebony fingerboards with it, but it's also a brilliant abrasive paste for polishing up old tools or anything like that. It's, it's just, uh, and we used to call it a more paste. And it was a French product, um, possibly from the jewellery business. I have no idea. It is no longer available. I think the Italians sell something that's meant to be like it. But from what I've heard, nothing is nothing as good as this. This paste for actual fine polishing on hard woods is just unbelievable. It's also got an absolutely gorgeous smell. I have no idea what it is. I have no idea what's in it. Nobody else does. But if somebody could analyse that and make it, they would make a fortune because musical instrument makers would die. That little bit in the tin, I would suspect that if I offered that to some musical instrument makers, they'd probably offer me a couple of hundred quid for that. It's so rare now. And we just that's different than That's different than the Renaissance? Does the that's Renaissance right. have a, a polish yeah, in it? Completely. It's just like a... I don't really know how to describe it. It's like a really, really hard, thick paste. But it, it's ultra, ultra fine. Um, it is not that very abrasive, but it does produce a really high polish when you rub it on anything. It's absolutely wonderful stuff. And I wish I could get some more. But I wonder if it has a, par a powdered rosin in it. Like they use on the bow when you're, you know, just uh, yeah, because I, that would, that would... I don't think it was ever sort of made for the musical instrument trade. I have a suspicion it was for the probably for polishing gold and silver and things like that in the jewelry trade. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. It was it was known in French France as a more paste, but that's as much as I can tell you. Um, and no, like I say, I think people have tried to recreate it, but nobody else has managed it. The tin it's in, um, whether it was always originally in that tin, but that tin, it's, it's that faded, I can't read it anymore, but that, that tin is a 19th century tin that probably did have powdered rosin in it. It's a company called Hart, who were one of the top London violin dealers in the 19th century. So it's, it's been in that tin a long while, but um, this tin, it actually, it may have come from J&A Beer in London originally, but... Um, but yeah, wonderful stuff. But uh, yeah, whether anybody could ever chemically analyze it and remake it, I don't know. But I wish they could. Richard, so I had a somewhat related experience recently. I, I sent a few leaves of one of my bonsais to a lab that did a DNA analysis. So if they can do that, I wonder if there's another lab that, that can do a chemical analysis. Yeah, it'd be great if they could. But I, I mean, it's not just the ingredients, it's how it's put together, really. That's the problem. Quantities. Yeah. The, yeah. The... Who's, who, who's the maker on the tin again? The maker on the tin? Oh, yeah, well, that's nothing to do with the Amore paste. That was um, Hart and Company. Um, I can't yeah. read it. It's that faded out. But they, they were violin dealers. But yeah. that, they probably originally contained violin rosin or something like that. But it, oh, it, I see. Okay, yeah, okay. They didn't distribute the Amore uh, paste. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Somebody's just shoved it in a tin, like yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that amour, amour is as, as in love paste. I think it's spelt like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, like I say, there is an Italian equivalent. I think they've tried to make, but from what I heard on through various friends in the trade, it was okay, but it wasn't anywhere near as good as a more the original amour paste, unfortunately. There are polishing compounds that you can buy for cars and automotive finishes that are very fine, but I think they would use a white, a leave of white film that you'd have to remove, but they, they would work for. Describe Chester, it's, it, it's just unbelievable the sort of polish it will put onto a finish. I mean, and on ebony, it's just absolutely brilliant. It just, you don't have to put a finish on ebony. You right, just, just raw. Put more paste into it and it just comes up just so glossy and black. It's absolutely brilliant, but yeah. Anyway, there's just a couple of uh, 
And I, I mean, the other thing, whether anybody else mentions it, I'm still a great lover of Renaissance wax for um, final finishing on my antique 18th century planes. This was formulated by, I think it was the British Museum. Mainly, it was originally made for leather, but they found it was great for putting on metals and wood and everything. And the great thing about it is completely reversible. It won't do any harm whatsoever to anything. That's why the, the museums use it. So I do love Renaissance wax. But does that, does the Renaissance wax have any kind of a, um, a grit to it at all? Is there any kind of a, because they talk about it having a cleaning uh, quality about it. That, uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I've, I've never really thought there was any actual abrasion it. as such. I'm not sure. I, 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 wouldn't have said, I wouldn't have said so. Um, no, I, don't, I think they wouldn't have done that because of what, why they made it. Yeah. No, it's 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 not at all. It's it's a it's a, it's just a microcrystalline. It's a microcrystalline. And uh, uh, that's just one brand name. But that you know, generally speaking, the only downside is what I found with it, which I used it before, was that it's a petrochemical sub substance, and so therefore, you know, it's 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 basically not natural. And, and, and therefore, Jim, that uh, petrochemical um, substance is what actually gives that um, bit of abrasive, abrasive cleaning. Um, yeah. It's not abrasive, but it's that cleaning effect that it gives. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the same one um, here, but this is a like a microcellular crystalline. Yeah, yeah. But, but I tell you what I use it for is on, on top of like the, um, the, the t uh, table saw or the, the band saw. I mean, it, it, it just glides across it. It's so great for that. And it, it's great. How does it smell? Quite okay. Uh, I would say it's also it's great for putting on uh, on the sole of bronze planes. Yeah, because uh, it stops them from from marking the wood. You you don't get those uh, black marks that you can sometimes get with with uh, bronze or gunmetal uh, plane bodies. Richard, if you Google a more paste, you can get uh, several different uh, types. You can get the anchovy, the tomato, or the herb. <laughs> no, I would go with the anchovy. <laughs> Best of love. Moving on, moving on. Right, we'll move on to uh, Rick. Sorry, 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 sorry. I've done this again. Daryl. Oh, okay. Uh, I missed the first bit of the, uh, the show. I was at work. Um, I use shellac a lot. Um, it's easy. Uh, it works well. Um, I buy the flakes and I, I got some 99% isopropyl alcohol from a local paint factory. We have a paint outlet up the, in the industrial area. And I use an old floppy disk drive as a magnetic stirrer. Um, so that just goes around in there real nice. And I, I picked up a nice Melita shellac grinder at a yard sale for $2. The crazy lady who sold it was using it for coffee or something. Crazy. Um, so that's my shellac setup right there. I just brush it on and wipe it on. It works. How is that disk drive working? Well, there's a, uh, an old, one of those uh, wall warts down there. And that just hooks in here and it just, I just uh, put a couple of rare earth magnets on the platen, put some thin um, plywood over top of it. And it just, there's a bar magnet inside there and it just uh, grabs onto it and turns it around. That's brilliant. So those old bits of technology you got lying around, you can reuse them. Brilliant, brilliant. So, so what do you do with the magnets when you brush on the finish? Do you drill them in or I don't see how magnets dissolve into the finish. They don't. They don't. They're reused they in the next it. yard. <laughs> oh my God. That oh, um, is it's just to stir the shellac. The isopropyl alcohol is, is, is the alcohol that is shellac is least soluble in. So that's why you need a you know constant stirring. Yeah. It will dissolve perfectly. But if you use ethanol, pure ethanol, um instead i i can't get that here you can't get what is it called um it begins with ever clear no we don't have yeah. that in canada you you're not allowed <laughs> that yeah of course they don't let you you loose on that do they just in case yeah it's no. uh, 
Oh, no. but, but I can buy the I can buy the ninety nine percent isopropyl from the paint store up the road. Sure, no problem. Sure. I was just I was just saying if if you could buy the Everclear or yeah. or similar, no. you know, because it it's it being hydroscopic, it will only be ninety seven percent, but yeah. but it's um, but it, it it dissolves almost immediately, and and with a little bit of warm warm uh, if you put it in a warm bath, um, it'll dissolve in less than twenty minutes or so. But just to disappoint that was yeah. all because yeah. i tried i tried isopropyl uh, because we can easily get it uh That's rubbing true. rubbing alcohol and it 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 and it took ages and ages and ages and i thought oh, what's going on here I've, and then i looked it up and it gave the three alcohols which is the methylated spirits i think you you even call it meth don't you denatured alcohol yeah uh but the idea is to keep water out of it basically isn't it jim why would you want to put it in your warm bath uh, you well, uh, you you would. I'm not. I'm More not allowed. Fun to, than a I'm not duck. allowed. To, I'm not allowed to continue with puns and jokes. I, I get banned. Jim, do you right? use it? Do you use it like? Um, do you use it like soap? Radox. You you do. Yeah. I, I just like to point out that you don't need it for Alfie shine. So okay, just just to finish <laughs> the conversation. I think it's because the the magnets are too abrasive when he puts them in a bath. Yeah, if it, it, well, he's up in the north. You see, if he was down in the south, he wouldn't need a magnet. Because especially on the equator, really, it would just wouldn't go around, would it? <laughs> right, we'll oh, no. move uh, swiftly on to Rick. <laughs> right, so um, on the topic of uh, um, shellac, this is what I've been using uh, since we don't have ever Everclear uh, jar. You can get this at uh, Canadian Tire in their uh, fireplace department, um, which I don't know. It seems to work for me, so. It's the only material I've used or uh, thinner I've used. So I don't know, I don't have really anything to compare to it. Um, but uh, I have uh, Wait, two what finishes. Is that? It's called Bioflame. Ah, huh. okay. And uh, I guess it's for cleaning fireplaces or something. I don't know. But uh, um, a friend of mine who, uh, who helped me out with mixing shellac the first time, he said that that's what he found was the best. So I tried it and haven't tried anything else. So uh, I can't really recommend it because I don't know if it's better than anything else. But you know, it's easy to get a Canadian Tire if you have one of those. So all right, Sorry, there is actually that Bioflame, and that's interesting because that that is absolutely pure ethanol. Yeah, it's uh, denatured ethanol is what it says on it. So yeah, it says the percentage water. I was just looking it up. It's absolutely pure. Oh. So that would be much more preferable to isopropyl. Okay. Yeah, that uh, the guy that I uh, got it from, he said, I've tried a bunch of stuff. Trust me, this is the best stuff. And, you know, he's smarter than I am. So I went with that. Um, so anyways, um, my two finishes, um, technically, they probably don't qualify as finishes. Um, but, uh, one is Jim's idea. This is all Jim and he shared it with me. So Jim, hope you don't mind, uh, micro mesh, um, with, uh, with some of my pencils, what I I'd been trying, uh, like a BLO mixture. Oh, there you go. Um, and yeah, mine, mine are smaller. So mine are Jeffrey size. <laughs> Um, and, um, but, uh, I'd been, uh, playing around with like, uh, BLO mixtures and, uh, wasn't really loving the finish I was getting. And, uh, Jim suggested, why don't you try micro mesh and they come in grits of, they start at 1500 and a million years later, you make it to 12,000. So it's not a quick finishing process, but it, you can get a really nice glass finish out of, um, yeah, I don't know how many are there, uh, that, uh, that I was really impressed with and uh, just gives a, a, a fantastic, uh, um, it's not glossy, it's very glassy. I don't know if there's, that, that's the way I see it is it, it's very reflective, but it doesn't look like, it doesn't give you that pool type of uh, reflection. So that's kind of cool. So that's the one. And the other one that I expected someone else would beat me to is this little guy right here, which I don't know how to pronounce. I think it's polissois or something like that, a French word. I don't speak French at all. So um, polisher in but, English. Yeah, it's a or yeah, polisher or burnisher or whatever. Um, and um, the instructions I got for it was to soak it in uh, 
um, in melted uh, beeswax. Um, has asked what? for something. Oh, okay. I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, so uh, basically, I just melted some wax, soaked it in there until it was totally full, and then I just um, cut the fibers until uh, till I had a nice uh, flat surface. And then you're basically just burnishing the surface. And I don't think the wax actually is part of the finish. I think it's just to lubricate it. Is that, um, a, Don Will is that a Don Williams one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I bought it from him. So, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting finish. And um, it was something that uh, when I first used it on a pencil, I was like, okay, this is exactly what I was looking for the finish, like the actual, what I imagined in my head, uh, this is what it came out as. Um, so uh, something fun to play around with. Um, and uh, I know a lot of people use different methods with it, but uh, kind of a cool thing to play with. A lot of work though, like it's, it's a physical uh, workout. If you're doing something larger for my pencils, it's not a big workout because they're really small. So what, you what you're basically doing is burnishing the finish. So you're actually flattening the yeah. surface and to, to get a reflective surface. That, that's yeah, the, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, one last thing um, for, for Jim here as a thank you. Uh, us North Americans have good news when it comes to Elfie Shine. Uh, I discovered that we have a Canadian uh, distributor for Elfie Shine now. So if you're like me, who absolutely cannot stand buying stuff from, uh, from Amazon, uh, this is an opportunity to put money on someone's plate as opposed to send it to a billionaire. So uh, as far as distributor, and then, you know, we want to support Jim whatever way we can, but uh, this is a way that we can uh, put, it, uh, put the distribution into someone who, uh, who can actually experience it as, uh, you know, a real income. Uh, and he's a local guy. He, he lives in the same town as me. I, I discovered that recently. Uh, and I talked to him. He's, uh, he does ship to, uh, throughout North, North America. So there you go. Who is it? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's called uh, Northwest Passage. Um, let me see if I can, uh, if I can put in a, a link here. And he's quite, and he's quite a reasonable price as well. Yeah, it looked good. Um, I think it was uh, $15 Canadian or $13 American. I might so. start buying mine from Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you know, the, the one problem I really had with uh, with Alcashan, I, I love the smell. No, 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 you can't. Well, no, no, no. We see. Switch, switch his mic off. Switch his oh, mic hold off. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I really don't like the taste. No, I, you know. <laughs> You know, when but I you, put it on toast, is okay. But once I toast it in a toaster, it just burns yeah, up. Yeah, if you if you try if you buy the fragrance free one, then you don't get that aftertaste. It's you know the one we recommend. Not for beers, we recommend the fragrance one because that's the the female attraction part of it. But for toast, no, definitely fragrance free. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's that's fine. Pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're over to. Um... Jeffrey, I think. Great. Uh, so, uh, I mean, what's really interesting here is um, a lot of people have got the same commonality, which is um, it's word of mouth, isn't it? It's, uh, you know, recommendations. And I think that's really important. And uh, I think when we look at it over time, um, there's fashions as well. You know, we go through these different fashions of what we like and how we want it, whether we want it really glossy or we want it matte or we want a hard finish or a soft finish. Um, but I mean, you know, listening to a lot of you tonight, I mean, Mitch mentioned about the chestnut um, products. I mean, I, I, they've got such a wide range of products. And I just thought I'd show you a couple. My um, my son and my daughter have been making um, cutting boards, um, started up a little business and they were sending them out and stuff for presents at Christmas. Um, and so they, they've used the... Um, that the, the food safe um, finish um, from, from chestnut there, which is which is quite good. And that there's another one which is quite interesting, just random, but uh, you know, you've got the lemon oil and, and when you open the top and smell the lemon oil, it's uh, it's as good as an Alfie shine, uh, you, you know, uh, smell there. Um, but um, you know, when, when you're hearing, um, you know, the different reactions and you're hearing about shellac and stuff and the shellac and you're hearing about, um, you know, the finishes, um, you know, we're always, you make a really nice table, you make a really nice sideboard and, and you, you're just worried about putting something on top and, uh, you know, that shellac could end up with the rings and, and, and what have you uh, on there. So one of my, um, one of my products I use um, for that is uh, the, the, the Melamine Lacquer, okay. 
Um, and this one here is, is absolutely a great product because you can just rub it in, um, put it on a cloth, rub it straight on. Um, and, uh, you know, two or three, um, two or three rubs of um, over, over a period of uh, maybe 10 minutes. Um, and you get a really hard finish that then you can put, you know, you put your cup of tea on it and it's fine, you know, and it, it works like that. So, I mean, I get mine from uh, Mylands. Um, so I'll just show that one again rather than put it in the thing there. Um, but the, the, the other things are is that, you know, that's one way of doing it. The other way I use it is oils. Um, and uh, of course, we can't we can't go without mentioning uh, Shane and, and we can't go, you know, with peacock oil. And I think over the over the years, he's um, given us sort of um, some some great products um, in the early days. Um, you know, you've got the, the smelly products, um, but, uh, you know, with a range of three different colours. Um, and then he went to the, the low odour products, um, you know, that you can then use. So they're not so smelly. OK. Um, and then he's gone to the, the wick um, now, which is, uh, you know, the wick, which is like the faster, faster drying. Um, all of these, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I use them on. Um, so when I've made planes, um, I've got a, a workbench that I'm making. I've done the whole top of that one. Uh, and I've used his um, uh, wax then to to uh, to to finish off on on the top, um, so the two products um, go together. Um, and of course, you can't go without saying, um, you know, the old uh, just to keep Jim happy, you know, with these uh, these different gift uh, gift versions of it uh, that you can see there. So um, a posh, a posh boy. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, really, the other person that we we have to mention actually, and he and he. he when you see, you know, if you ever went to like the European Woodworking Festival, there would always be someone there making uh, uh, wax um, and, uh, you know, giving demonstrations on, on polishing and stuff. And it's Derek and he's, he's not been here for a while. And uh, it was quite interesting. Someone, uh, Chester was saying about, you know, when you've got a when you've got an Alfie shine or a, or a, a peacock wax, you know, the small tins, what you actually really need is, is the, uh, the bulk stuff. So this is the low fat rubu wax on a, on a larger scale. So there we are. Where so, do you uh, get that? Where do you get that? Is that Derek's? Um, Derek, yeah, Derek, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's only if your so your bench is on a diet, isn't it? The low fat one. <laughs> no, it's uh, he's, he's got hard and medium wax, so you're you're okay there. <laughs> um, yeah, so but that is a problem because a lot of these things and these products we're talking about, like the peacock oil, the Alfie shine, they're great for the pens, they're great for the planes, the smaller projects. But then, um, I mean, not that this chair is that big, but but still, if you're doing a lot of, if I'm doing three or four of them, you know, I would go through my Alfie shine. I, I save my Alfie shine for things for me, not for customers. Um, but it would be nice to be able to buy a large quantity. That's great. The reason why you can't buy Alfie shine in a large quantity like that is because of export license requirements for over, uh, air transportation it has to be in that tin and anything smaller uh, so that's the reason behind that and we 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 require we require instant sort of gratification for sales from the uk because a lot of countries don't actually sell it within the country so you know you've got australia sells it through chris vesper and so on but but for actual transportation across borders it has to be that size or lower sorry no that's all right it's got it um but, and but that's the same what the same reason why Shane has produced the the the, the non VOC version of the of the of the uh, oil is that he couldn't he had to ship it by sea because of the shipment requirement. So you know it's, it, it's a logistical thing, not not uh, not we're trying to deprive you of any volume because I'm sure we could sell you a ton of it. No, but yeah. um, Chester, you can always have a go at making it yourself, though, can't you? Well, what I wind up doing is buying Johnson's or Minwax uh, finishing paste and things like that and, um, for, for customers' work. Um, uh, but it, unless it's something small, in which case I use the Alfie Shine. But I have an extra tin. This, this one's almost gone. You know, you buy a second one early so you don't run out. Yeah, it's so like having two, two tanks on your Bentley. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Or on your old Ford truck, but either yeah. way, yeah. <laughs> okay. Jeffrey, can, can I ask you... You said you can always do it yourself. Make it yeah, yourself. Yeah, yeah. Make you can make your own wax up. Um, so just um, change the different in, um, quantities of the ingredients if you want to make a hard wax or a medium wax, um, and and make it up. So if you if you go back to um, 
that one of the talks, you know, Yannick did a talk with us, um, the ingredients, he gave the ingredients in that talk um, to make it to make one up. Um, or you can just go on to uh, Derek's website um, and he's got instructions on how to make it and the ingredients on there as well. Nice. And what do you do for the smell to, to make it smell like Alfie Shine? Uh, it's the taste that's the most difficult to put in. Well, you see, that's the bit that's, you know, that's the bit that only Alfie knows. Okay. And Alfie's got a nose for that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll move swiftly on to Paul. <laughs> swiftly on to Paul. <laughs> ah. dear. There we go. So, of course, the obligatory Alpha Shy, which I like. And then we have this one, which I found, which is uh, one by Alcox. And it's a lot softer than Alpha Shine, so it is actually easier to apply, and it does seem to, seem to absorb quite well. Uh, but the other thing which I found... Uh, read the other day, which was interesting, was uh, the use of mare's tail as a uh, fini sort of like a burnishing sort of stuff. Did we have that? Were we talking about that in, uh, in, the, in the group? I'm, uh, I'm not yeah. an expert. That's, that's right. Uh, I, I, read it, I read that basically a lot of places where we did a lot of Musical instrument manufacture, you find but that this is a the lot burnish of... after the wax, right? You apply the wax and then you use that as a burnisher. Yeah, I think so. But it, it was just interesting because I just know it is a pernicious weed. I didn't realize it actually had a use. But I think it's a high silica content in the actual grass. If if you try to kill it, you have to crush it before you apply any weed killer because it's impervious to weed killer. Yeah, going back to what I was discussing about the um, Ciccone violin varnish, he did a lot of experiments on what he thought um, Stradivari actually may have used as varnishes. And there was a, a lower layer of um, like a, a base coat of something. But what they found was that there was a lot of silica in that base coat. And you'll find that the, the top oil coat of varnish on a Stradivari um, doesn't adhere very well to the base coat and it's because of the silica. And the thing is they, 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 they worked out that they were using the silica not as a burnisher um, on the finish, they were actually using it as an abrasive to finish the wood. So they were using mare's tail, horse tail grass as an abrasive, as well as fish uh, shark skin. They were the two abrasives they were using. So. Somebody put in the chat about pumice as well, which is something we shouldn't forget about pumice being an exceptionally fine uh, volcanic powder um, and something which I used when I was doing the French polishing. And it is very much a surprise because it gives um, very few scratches because of the fineness, the talcum powder like. Uh, properties that the using it in a circular fashion will create a, very much like a random orbiter sander, but uh, in a much more refined hand hand way. Uh, so that that's another thing that that modern well not modern because it's probably used to Egyptian times, but pumice is one hundred percent something that is uh, very familiar in the French polishing world. I think we all have to assume that whatever er, what we're all talking about are sort of. Um, uh, things that we use specifically maybe more often than others, but it doesn't in any way cover the, the vast. I mean, I have behind me different finishes that I haven't talked about because they'll change according to how big a job I have or, or you know, or what the actual wood is or, you know, whether it's Japan dryer and uh, painting and different other finishes. So I'm assuming or, or I, I think that we all should assume that we're not covering maybe 20% of all the different finishes. I mean, I do use olive oil and beeswax as well, which is one which I made up myself out of extra virgin olive oil and beeswax, which I melted together. Uh, my initial attempt didn't go too well because I had too much beeswax that I couldn't actually move it. <laughs> and the olive, didn't, didn't, uh, the olive oil didn't turn rancid over time or anything? There no, was no... 
I've had not a problem with it. People sort of said, but, you know, in some respects, uh, I, mean, I know that James Wright did a thing on finish, and he sort of said, ranting is what you want because you know, that's, that's the polymerization. But I've had no problems with it going mouldy or anything else. Various people sort of said, oh, you shouldn't, shouldn't use yes, olive but, oil. But the issue here is that there's, there's olive oil and there's olive oil, right? Even within the extra, extra, extra virgin oil in places like Croatia, which is considered the best place to find olive oil, even within that, that category, you know, you, you have different refinements of cold pressed and different, you know, levels of quality. And I think some of the ones that go rancid are the stuff that is, are cut because a lot of them are cut with sunflower oil and other um, yeah. agricultural oils. And therefore, when you buy it off the shelf, it says olive oil in the bottle. When is it in fact only has to have, and I believe the EU said that it was like 20% olive oil to be called yeah, that's olive oil. The same here, the same here. It's an issue that you have to be real cautious buying olive oil. Yeah. Because it might not be olive oil. And the same, and the same with camellia oil, which is uh, another issue that is also cut with sunflower oil simply because making either of the sunflower, uh, sorry, the olive oil or the camellia oil requires a huge amount of labor and also product, uh, raw product, and therefore sunflower is much easier industrially to produce, and therefore they cut it and therefore they sell it. So you have to be very careful when you buy it that you buy what's recommended rather than what you see on the shelf. As well on the beeswax, I buy, my, I buy blocks of beeswax because I use them on all my turnings on the lathe. I use, the only finish I use is a burnished beeswax that I melt into the finish, and then I use a, a rag to, to boil it and spread it evenly and it goes into the pores but i just use that and i bought two or three different blocks of bee beeswax that were straight from the hives and um and the uh the wax itself had different colors depending on what where where the bees were pollinating um sure. so uh some of them are darker amber and some and they will affect the a change in the wood that you're applying it to it, it and, does and, try and and also, uh, it, you have to be careful because you, you've got the various sugars in it as well. So, you know, you, you're going to you have to have it un unadulterated. So you have to process it yourself a little bit. Um, and to make it harder, uh, you use coconut wax, so it's basically carnauba wax. Um, you know, so you can you can't use carnauba wax on its own because it's too hard. But if you mix it with beeswax, which is too soft, you get a you get a to the level the paraffin. You the paraffin wax that you can buy, the Gulf puts out, which is an oil-based product, yeah. um, it, it it tends to leave a white film uh, when it dries, and um, you can polish that out, and then it, as it dries a little bit more, it just leaves this sort of white haziness that I don't. I, like. I, so, I would I would definitely avoid petroleum yeah. products myself because yeah. you, you know I you agree. really are you're not being good for the environment either. So yeah, yeah. Or, or your health. No, your own. Yeah, I agree. That's why I use the raw linseed oil rather than the boiled. And then I'll use the uh, polymerized for a finish coat on it once it's dried. The, 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 the dryers, which are in, in uh, boiled linseed oil, even double boiled linseed oil, are, are uh, extremely toxic, horrible. Yeah. In, many case, in most cases. Yeah, that's why I'd be interested to see what um, he was saying, what Matthias was saying about the one that he got that doesn't seem to have a, an obnoxious smell. I wonder uh, what drying agent they're using in it. I, 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 Mateus, is, is, do they put, is, that's not stand oil though, that's non-polymerized, right? Yes, that's non-polymerized. So that is uh, boiled linseed oil, not, not stand oil. They do stand oil as well. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I'm not the maker. I can't swear to the ingredients, but I've been looking at. Uh, I put the link to the safety data sheet in the, in the chat a while back. Uh, there is no mention of. There are no VOCs. There are. It's there's no mention of anything uh, that is usually used as dryers. That doesn't prove anything because there are there are limits to the quantities I believe are that there are, are levels of that, from right. which you have to report that it's in there if it's below the threshold you don't necessarily have to mention it and I'm not an expert on reading safety data sheets either so I don't 
I can't swear to it, but but smell wise, I mean, I pick up the bottle and I unscrew the cap, and it smells delightful. Mm. It's, it's 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 not not only does it not smell bad, it actually smells nice. Is this the the Otterson one? Yes. Yeah, um, I talked with a restorer quite recently who uh, uses two German makers and the Otterson one. Yeah. And it, it indeed is without uh, any secretives. Yeah. Uh, the process they boil it is they don't really boil it. It's more uh, a process with UV, UV light and blowing uh, oxygen into the oil in the process. That's how they pre-polymerize it. Yeah, so okay, so it, it is so, so it, it is partly poly, poly, polymerized, and so it is. You could say it, it, it's starting to approach a stand oil kind of quality. Well, a stand oil is just a, a, a pre-polymerized uh, boiled yeah. linseed oil you keep in sunlight. Yeah, yeah. That's how that's how we make our stand oil. Yeah, but but that that but that naturally improves the drying speed without the need for artificial dryers, which is what. Yes. The, no, but they, they also don't really boil it. So they, they blow no. oxygen into it and treat it with UV light because it's yeah. a much safer process. Yeah. In in yeah. the UK, the best one for that uh, is in fact what, what Jeffrey was talking about is my lands. My lands make a beautiful stand oil, which is linseed oil based, and that, that is absolutely virtually similar to the Swedish one. Yeah. But 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 anyway, this one Chester is available in the states as well. So the link I put in the chat to the safety data sheet is from the one of the U.S. distributors. So if you would like to check it out, yes, uh, you yeah. can also give them a ring and, and talk to them. Yeah, safety, think, yeah. safety data yeah. sheets can can be a little bit deceptive though because. Yes. Okay. A lot of the nasty stuff in, in boiled linseed oil is, is not actually just the, the heavy metals which are added as secretives, but agents used during centrifugation of, of the oil. Okay. They, they uh, infuse the cake with, with all kinds of nasty chemicals mm -hmm. to get a higher yield. Oh, right. And I know Otterson and, for example, Lionel Pro in, in Germany uh, have a pure uh, centrifugation. Uh, centrifugation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is, that, is, is that even in the case of the, uh, of the raw linseed oil? Of, of course, yeah, the raw, the raw is, is the basis for the later boiled one. So. Right, so it still has the, those issues, even uh, the raw. M most have, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I, I have to say that I, I, like the, I like the low, uh, the long drying time because it allows the time for the wood to keep soaking it in. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I do a wipe off afterwards, and I take it back down, and then I let it dry, um, and then you know, so so that way I, you know, it dries a little faster later, but it it gives it time to get into the wood grain. Yeah, yeah, no, that, I mean that's that's true. I think that with raw linseed oil, you get more of a penetration because it takes that much longer to dry, whereas with a, a stand oil, you will actually start to get uh, almost a film finish because it yeah. dries quickly enough that it actually forms. So, so the, the, uh, the Le Tonquinois that I was talking about yeah. is also, yeah. uh, that's a stand, stand oil based. It's based on, li the, the main ingredient is linseed stand oil. And that one gives a lovely thick, clear film. Uh, and so it's, it's great as a varnish, but it's not, it, and it penetrates to some extent the first couple of coats, but it's not, uh, I don't think it's, it would be as good if, if you want a, an oil finish rather than a varnish finish, uh, stand oil is less interesting. This, this is my stand oil. Ah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, we, we practically only use it to, to touch up uh, our wooden windows or, or as a primer for, for a coat with oil paint. But right. I was uh, before we bring this, uh, that you talk to the people at Otoson. Hmm. Right, before we uh, bring this call to a close, um, or at least the recording to a close, um, I'm going to chip in with my um, contribution for tonight. Mm -hmm. And uh, two finishes that no one's really mentioned. And um, the first one that, that I use uh, fairly frequently as a good finish, which I don't have to worry about, is Osmo Poly-X oil. 
it is actually a floor finish. Uh, and there is, there's a huge variety of different finishes with different uh, colors and, and so on. Um, but I tend to go for the clear matte uh, or the clear, the clear satin um, versions. And it tends to make the wood look a little bit wet. Um, so it, it brings out the color in the wood without really doing too much to it. It's a hard wax oil. So it does buff to a really nice finish as well. It uh, doesn't penetrate too deep, but it's really hard wearing. And I like it for things like uh, tables and so on because it lasts. And if, if it does get scuffed up, you can just sand back the area and reapply. And um, there's you no, know, I, I know it's a flooring finish, but it's, it's great for using on furniture as well. Um, another finish that I uh, chose to use recently is Danish oil. Uh, Rustin's, which is the original recipe for Danish oil. Um, it, it combines the best of both, uh, which is, I love the, the boiled or linseed oil. I, I, I like the look that linseed oil gives to wood and what it adds to wood. But I also like the protective film finish that a, that a poly, uh, is it polyurethane finish um, gives to wood over shellac. Um, it's just more durable. So Danish oil was a good choice for me uh, recently in a jewelry cabinet that I built. And then of course, Alfie Shai. Uh, and I, I have got the, the, the full kit. Um, oh, and gosh, and I, the, the reason I love Alfie Shine so much is because it, it buffs to a finish that no other waxes that I have used before do. Um, the I, I used to use brie wax a lot and I had some old tins which contained toluene and I hated the smell absolutely hated the smell and part of finishing I hate finishing um, finishing is the worst part of a project in my opinion uh, because I think it's the the time you can completely destroy a project if you don't finish it well uh, but also it's it's just the smells of any chemicals and things that go into a finish that I put on it. I hate using. Um, you know, one of the things we've all touched on the, the actual products that we're using to finish, but we're, we're not really touching too much on uh, products that we use to uh, either sand or to, uh, or to burnish or uh, between, between coats. These are great things that um, uh, these 3M pads uh, of all different grits. Um, I used to only use four aught steel wool, but one of the things is when I do a spray lacquer, I always use gloss. I only buy gloss and, um, and I spray gloss. And then I go back over with one of these and with some oil and I can take it to whatever matte finish that I want um, as opposed to bringing it to a gloss the other way. But um, there are other different things that people use in between the coats different sandpapers, different uh, steel wools, different things like that, that uh, is another extension of this conversation. Yeah. I think yeah. Chester, you've, uh, you've, you've managed to bring this talk to a perfect close. <laughs> I think that the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a good, there's a good uh, future topic to look there. Yeah. Uh, and um, I, think, I think I'd like, like to ask everyone to raise a glass to the bench. Cheers. To the bench. Yeah, to the bench. Thank you. Thank you everyone for a great yeah. A perfect finish. <laughs>